Our family has always loved going to lesser traveled locations, but today we ventured to one of the most visited in the world, Venice, Italy. We're excited. We've always dreamed of coming here, but something strange is happening in Venice right now. In September of 2023, the city was reviewed by the UNESCO World Heritage Committee, with many among them arguing that Venice is in danger. In danger of what, exactly? Cultural danger. Certainly a danger of the first world. Some at UNESCO believe that Venice has sold its soul to tourism, creating over-tourism, and has in that process lost much of its cultural significance. Venice sees 5 million tourists a year on an island with only 50,000 inhabitants. During peak travel from July to October, the city's residents are outnumbered two to one and losing almost a thousand residents a year, even the term Venetian is in danger of extinction. In a city struggling to keep its cultural significance afloat, are there any authentic experiences to be had? Venice is constructed of over 100 islands, many with their own unique flair, and we're venturing out to discover the story behind as many as we can. Day one in Venice is the only Venice day for many tourists to this city. Whether they stay on the island, come in from the mainland, or waddle off a cruise ship, their day is fixed. A trip to St. Mark's Square to gaze and admire, a walk over Rialto Bridge for a selfie, a quick gelato pick, and most importantly, a gondola ride. And for most people that visit Venice, that's it. Our day begins elsewhere though, on the island of Murano. Murano is the sleepier neighbor to Venice proper and has its own unique flair. We depart Murano for Venice, the sweet tourist IG Mecca land, and yes, it does photograph quite nicely. But we have two small children, and sightseeing has only endured for the allowed five minute quota that is set by our hyperactive two year old. Then, we need an activity. We wanted to find something pure in Venice, to meet a proper Venetian fighting to preserve something really authentic to the history of the city that would allow us to see it in a different way. Enter our new friend, Emiliano. Emiliano founded an organization called Venice Onboard that preserves old Venetian rowboats and gondolas, but also primarily tries to instruct local Venetians on the traditional ways of rowing. Venice is so unique in that your only means of transit are your own feet or a boat. And for that reason, boating and rowing are extremely integral to the heritage of local Venetians. And Emiliano's passion for bringing back that traditional life to the disposable modernism of Venice was really inspiring. But for us, Venetian rowing is much more than, than something for tourists or, or a sport. So we, we, we think it's important to, to preserve also the idea of Venetian rowing as a way of transportation and uh, a way to uh, explore the city. Uh, in this map, it's interesting because this color canal you see is the only area where speedboats can navigate. So that's why we, we, we think it's important to, to incentive the people to use this type of boat. Emiliano told us about the forcula, which is the Venetian oar lock. The forcula is made with walnut, that it's very, it's super nice food. It's, it lasts a long time and it's, it resists to the salty water and the sun, it's, it's amazing. Its current form allows rowers seven different rowing positions to move forward, backward, and sideways with complete precision. Next, we were ready to learn to row ourselves through the Venetian canals. A gondola ride through Venice can cost a lot of money, over a hundred euros usually for a half hour ride. And Emiliano and his team want to offer something that can be an alternative to what can usually be a little bit of a cookie cutter experience for tourists. And uh, instead of use the upper body, mainly, like uh, English rowing or canoeing, we use core and legs, mainly. I'm riding the boat. You're rowing the boat, Oz. Look at you. Mom, I'm moving to you. She says it's kind of like flipping them. pancakes. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Good job, Ozzy. Next, we venture to a part of Venice that has been almost entirely abducted by establishments servicing tourists. We took the Vaporetto from Murano to our new destination for the day, 
Lido. The Vaporetto system in Venice is the public transportation of the city, all on boats. It really is a magical and unique experience to head to a dock and get on a boat every time you're ready to go somewhere. Lido means shore in Italian, and that's exactly what it is. Five miles of uncut shorefront looking straight into the Adriatic Sea. Our girls were excited to have some time at the beach, and we found an interesting way of getting there. We rented a gimmicky Surrey bike for the morning, and it was actually a perfect silly mode of transportation around the island and a fun ride for our girls. Lido is unique in that it does have cars, but is still part of the city of Venice. We biked on the roads and headed out to the beach. The man renting us our bike pointed us to this beach on the northern tip of Lido. He said he'd spent his childhood running around those beaches. Did you pick it? Can you say pick? Pick. Good girl. The beach is unique in that you can actually walk onto it for free. The four miles running south from this beach have been taken over by beach clubs. These beach clubs sit one right after the other and they have these big fences to keep people from getting in without paying. And it's really a shame because outside of the summer months, all of the tourists leave and then it just leaves large portions of the beach inaccessible to the locals. We enjoyed the free access beach in the north. We all played in the sand and the girls eventually wandered into the water, though we hadn't brought any swimsuits. We went on a joy ride around the island, having some mobile snacks and eventually ended where we began, vaporettoing back to our Murano apartment. We came to stay on Murano due to finding well-priced accommodation with easy access to the Vaporetto. However, it is really a wonderful place to anchor during a trip to Venice. Before 10 a.m. and after 6 p.m., the island is home only to locals. There's only one significant hotel on Murano and the rest of the island is residential. Evening walks here are calm, quiet, and beautiful. Almost a week into our trip, we hadn't even explored the core offering of the island that we were staying on. Murano is known around the world for its glasswork, and glass artists display cups and plates in their shops on the cheap end, all the way up to chandeliers and modern art pieces on the expensive end. People flock every day to these shops to pick up a little bit of certified Murano glass to bring back to their homes. We had a unique opportunity to stay in an apartment owned by two world-renowned glass artists that even featured some of their work. We stayed right above one of their three Venetian glass shops, all focused mostly on glass jewelry. We wanted to see some of this glass working firsthand, and when I was in college, I had the opportunity to take a glass blowing workshop that was really fascinating, but it made a lot of these demonstrations available in Murano a little bit redundant to my own knowledge base. So we continued to walk from shop to shop until we happened upon an unmarked shop that had some craft supplies out on a table, and having kids, we were pretty intrigued. We met Cesare, who works in his father-in-law's glass studio making glass jewelry. We quickly got into a discussion with him about the over-tourism problem in Venice. For the city is a big problem. Right. I think a solution can be trying to offer something different. We always talk about the quality of the tourist. But the quality you can change if you start to change what you offer. Cesare has developed a simple yet brilliant method of making glass jewelry in only an hour, and it's his solution to getting people to slow down a little bit, connect with glass design, and take even their own unique design home with them when they leave. He said that this method has forced people to slow down because after creating their design, the pieces melted together in Cesare's unique kilns and then has to cool for an hour. Cesare believes that this allows people to take a breath and wander around Murano less rushed, possibly stopping to take in more than the first few shops along the Vaporetto stop. It often forces people who wouldn't have otherwise even sit down and have a meal in Murano, which even helps out local restaurants. And he said that he just notices a marked difference between the people that have an hour to spare and the people who don't. And the people that do have an hour to spare just seem more willing to connect with the work that is actually done on Murano as opposed to just taking it in, buying something cheap, and then departing on the Vaporetto. Since we were staying in Murano, we didn't have to rush back after an hour, but returned before closing to pick up our one-of-a-kind glass necklace. After exploring Venice, Lido, and Murano, we didn't have much time left. The last two places we wanted to visit were Torcello and Burano, each with their own story. 
Torcello is a small island that is sparsely inhabited by 12 total residents. Torcello is sometimes said to be the original Venetian settlement, though that's been disputed. It's a sleepy island with little to see or do. But despite this, tourists arrive in droves, pouring off Vaporetto No. 12 all day long to photograph the meager POIs of the island. It's a strange vibe, and we were eager to depart to Burano, an island boasting two cultural traditions we were eager to explore. Lacework and fishing have always been interconnected in Burano, and the fishermen of Burano have always specialized in the catching of Moeche soft shell crabs in the Venetian lagoon. And we reached out to a couple of fishermen to learn a little bit more about what they do, only to find that there has been a huge shift in the industry. An invasive species of American blue crabs has hit the Italian coast hard in the past year. This giant crab has no natural predators and therefore has bred en masse rather quickly. But why would someone not want an endless supply of these delicious blue crabs? Well, they've been eating all of the mussels, clams, and moeche along the Italian coast literally gobbling up ingredients that are core to so many Italian dishes. The fishermen of Burano don't have any moeche to catch because they've all been eaten. The few fishermen we did encounter were engaged in what can only be described as maintenance, cleaning nets, organizing supplies, and checking traps that remain empty. Their trade is in danger, and with it, a significant part of Burano's culture. The second trade of Burano is lacework. Hundreds of years ago, the women of Burano used their knowledge gained from mending their husband's fish nets and began to create beautifully intricate lace. As with many things in Venice, tourism has incentivized people to take shortcuts for profit. And much of the lace you can find in Burano is now sadly made in Asia. The few ateliers that still exist are extremely protective of their work. They don't allow filming or photography of their products or processes. Nonetheless, fake goods run rampant in Burano. And coupled with the fable of how the colorful houses came to be, they've largely turned the island into a checkbox on a bucket list photo safari. Venice is facing a siege on its cultural assets on multiple fronts, from environmental to social. Foreign crabs have invaded to devour the reliable fishing trade of Burano, and Chinese merchandise is muddying the authenticity of Murano's glass and Burano's lacework. The relaxed beaches of Lido have been boarded up by the beach club gatekeepers that block access to the namesake amenity of this island. In central Venice, fraught with photo-seeking tourists delivered by the boatload throughout the warmer months has forced out thousands of multi-generational Venetians, leaving fewer and fewer true Venetians to conserve the local color and traditions. I think it's very sad because we, uh, you're, we're losing the soul of the city, you know what I mean? It's crazy, it's crazy, it's, yeah. <laughs> Is Venice in cultural danger? Yes, and on multiple fronts, but is Venice still a place that you can find some authenticity? Absolutely. In our experience, the key to seeing Venice at its best was in its people. So long as there are Venetians passionate about their city, fighting to preserve its history and traditions, it will continue to thrive and evolve. It's our responsibility as tourists to follow their lead, to as much as possible avoid the day tours and the replicable photo ops, and instead opt for experiences that can connect us with the traditions, crafts, and lifestyle that they value and are fighting to preserve.